Hey guys, it is so good to see you again. Thanks for uh, finding your way to our channel. If this is your first time, let me just take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Jesse Hernandez. I'm an associate pastor here at our local church, Centro Cristiano Manuel in San Angelo, Texas. I serve under our awesome lead pastors, Noe and Santa Ana Hernandez. Uh, we just want to remind you really quickly that if you uh, want to go ahead and click that subscribe button, you can go ahead and subscribe to our channel here at CCM Manuel. Hit the notification bell so that way you get notifications every time new content is being loaded. Uh, if you want to follow us on Facebook, of course, you can follow us through the profile Noe Hernandez, CC. Uh, Emmanuel. Um, for those of you that have uh, been coming back to our channel, you know that every Wednesday around this time, uh, around six o'clock, we post our English Bible study, uh, which I've had the privilege of doing for the past uh, about six months now. And so we are uh, in the study called The Life and Teachings of Christ. And so I just want to take a, a minute here to introduce the book to you because I know it's been a few weeks and I'm trying not to do it every single week. So uh, every few weeks, I just want to remind you about the book and where you can find it, okay? So this is the book we're doing for our Wednesday study in English. It's called The Life and Teachings of Christ. It's an amazing uh, study book that is uh, offered through the Faith and Action series. Uh, they actually have a really great collection of study books. And so uh, the links are provided below so that you can go straight to the publisher, straight to Faith and Action, and it'll take you straight uh, to this particular study. And uh, when you click on it, of course, it's going to look a little different because this book is about 10 to 15 years old. Um, but the study's the same, uh, the format is the same, and the content is, for the most part, the same. There may be a few things that they've added over the years with the newer editions, uh, but again, when you click on it, it's going to look different, but it is the same study. It's the life and teachings of Christ. For those of you that are interested in maybe uh, getting your credentials uh, or you're interested in going through Global University so that way you can take this course as a credit, uh, this would be a great supplementary teaching for you. Um, these videos, I mean, would be a great supplementary, uh, supplementary teaching for you. Uh, they offer not only the curriculum uh, for this um Global University not only offers a curriculum for this particular study, uh, but also a student handbook that will just help you go a little bit deeper uh, into, into the scriptures, into the word, and into, again, this particular course. So, again, that's the Life and Teachings of Christ. Go ahead and scroll down and follow the link so that you can get your copy of this book through Faith and Action Series. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and jump into the study. So today we're talking about people are like one of two trees. And so we, we kind of jumped ahead last week when we were talking about roads and foundations because I wanted to spend one lesson talking about just uh, the trees or, or the parable of the trees that Jesus gives us. Uh, and so today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 23. Um, and Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. Again, this is uh, unit 2, chapter 3, lesson 3G, three, people are like one of two trees. The scriptures for that are Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23, and Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. If you want to pause here and read those scriptures so that way you can be familiar with what we're talking about, you can. Or if you want to follow along uh, as I break these scriptures down, you can go ahead and do that as well. So um, the first scriptures that we're looking at in Matthew are essentially broken down into two subheadings. And so uh, the, the first main heading, I would say, is, is in my Bible anyways, called a tree and its fruit. A tree and its fruit. Um, and the first uh, part of that would be Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20, where we are looking specifically at true and false prophets, true and false prophets. So Matthew chapter 7, if you want to read along with me, uh, this is verses 15 to 20. I'm reading from the NIV. Verse 15 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Verse 17, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear 
bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Um, so in the earlier version of the NIV, you actually don't get uh, this breakdown between uh, the, the first and second parts, which again, this first part is uh, in the newer version or in the newer edition of the NIV, focuses specifically on true and false prophets. And so I, I kind of want to uh, look at this uh, just really quickly here. Uh, within the context of tree and, and fruit and bearing fruit, right? Uh, if you've been in the church for long enough, then you've heard this, this parable and, and you've heard um, this idea about how we, we as people are compared to trees and we bear fruit. We either bear good fruit or we bear bad fruit. But in this first part uh, in, in, in the scriptures, we're actually looking at a reference to somebody who's not just your average follower, right? It's not just your average person that's going to, going to church, not just your average person that's having a relationship uh, with, with Jesus. We're talking about someone who uh, the scripture, people who the scripture specifically designate as false prophets. And so let's, let's tie in this idea of people bearing fruit with the notion of false prophets or, or just prophets, I would say, in general. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about before we, we, we delve into the scripture is this idea of prophet and what that actually means. And so I know that uh, there's a lot of, especially in the charismatic Christian denominations, there's a lot of people that believe that prophets are people that tell the future, right? So a prophet is somebody that will share with you what is going to happen either in your life or your family's life or your church's life or even the nation, and they share the future uh, with you. And so um, in that sense, they, they are, you know, you know, functioning, I would say, under the anointing of a prophet, assuming that they are correct, assuming that they actually are hearing from Holy Spirit. But the truth is, within the context that we're looking at in the teaching of Jesus, a prophet here is not necessarily someone who's sharing the future. The, the, the prophet here, the office of the prophet, is essentially someone who is speaking the word of God. So at the end of the day, we we believe that if someone really is of God and they are prophesying the future, they're sharing what God is telling them uh, to tell you or to tell the congregation or to tell the nation or, or whoever, whatever body of people, what, what is on God's heart, what is on God's mind, what God is saying concerning uh, in this particular respect, the future. But within the context of what Jesus is talking about, it's not just the future for for the the purpose of defining in in the most simplest term what the the purpose of a prophet is what their office entails it's essentially sharing the word of god and so this is not necessarily word separate from the bible a prophet is someone who again in, in the most basic way that we can understand sharing god's word is who literally reads the bible studies the bible analyzes the bible and then shares the bible with others a prophet is someone who shares the word of god including the bible not necessarily the future so you you could function within the office of a prophet or within a, within the you know the anointing uh, of of the of a prophet and be sharing what scripture says and sharing what the word of god says and so that is the context here and so in that sense i don't want you to confuse it necessarily with somebody who who's a teacher or or even just a pastor or a preacher but that is where Jesus is coming from within this context. And, and, and again, we're going to look at these scriptures again here in a minute. But within this context, it's not necessarily someone who just talks about the future, right? It's about someone who shares what God is saying, be that in the Bible or, or be that, um, you know, out not outside of the Bible as in a part uh, or, or extra, I should say, but what they feel that Holy Spirit is sharing with them in that moment, again, for that person or that congregation or, or that body of people. Um, so, so it's not necessarily 
limited, I should say, to the future. Now that we have an understanding about what he means uh, when he talks about false prophets, or specifically what he's talking about when he uses the word prophet, um, now let's look at the scriptures you know, a little bit more closely. So it says, watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. And so the first uh, picture that we get here is the, a picture of somebody who on the outside looks like they like they're part of part of the group part of the culture um but someone who looks and, and i hesitate to say somebody who looks christian because the truth is there really isn't a christian look in my opinion right today we we uh, are the christian church walks um, in a level of freedom that i would say where there isn't a certain look right it, there there isn't uh, uh, any one particular way to dress for you to look at that person and say, oh, that person's a Christian. Because again, Christians come in all shapes and sizes and, and flavors and, and languages and, and cultures. And like Christians are, are not bound by a certain dress code other than uh, what the New Testament and even the Old Testament teaches us as far as modesty is concerned, right? So we wouldn't necessarily expect a Christian to, to dress immodestly if they have a, a genuine understanding of the, of the scripture. If they've been taught, again, if they have been taught sound biblical doctrine in terms of modesty, if somebody has taken the time to teach them, and if they have received that revelation uh, from Holy Spirit uh, to dress modestly, um, then all those things combined should result in somebody who walks around, in the very least, dressed modestly. Other than that, there's no specific dress code, right? Uh, back in the day, I guess you could say that church people, you know, did the whole, you know, dresses. And, and I know, at least in my culture, uh, there's a lot of, of, of churches, a lot of church people, a lot of denominations that, you know, you couldn't wear jewelry, you couldn't wear makeup, you had to, to wear your hair, you know, tied back. Some some in my culture believe that you, you have to wear the, the little uh, head covering, um, you had to be covered, most of your skin had to be covered, uh, with the exception of maybe your arms or your hands or your feet, possibly, and even then you had to wear, you know, like tights or, or, or uh, pantyhose, and so anyways, for the women, for the men, most men had to come dressed in slacks and dress shirts and ties and suits if they were able to, uh, or if not, just, just clean um, and looking nice, and so we have sort of moved away from that, but um, but it's understandable, right? Because even in, in, in the culture of the, of what we would call the time of Jesus, um, certain religious groups dressed a certain kind of way. And that's sort of kind of how you were able to identify, um, what group or, or what part of society that you belonged to. And so, uh, it wasn't, you know, uh, the notion I should say wasn't, wasn't foreign to them, but on a deeper level, this idea of being dressed in sheep's clothing also speaks to how a person comes off, right? So your first impressions of that person. So beyond how they look on the outside, your first impression of a person uh, can also be a false impression. So they can come off as being nice and charismatic and friendly and amiable. And they could even come off as being kind and even kind of generous, uh, depending on the situation and, and, and what is uh, you know going on. Um, but, but people are, are able to, at least for, for short term periods, to present themselves a certain way in terms of their character, in terms of their personality, to come off a certain kind of way. I mean, and, and, and it, it would be false of me to say that this doesn't happen all the time, right? Because most people don't put out their authentic selves to, you know, all the time to everybody, especially when you're meeting new people, most people will put off, you know, their better self. They will, they will attempt to, to introduce themselves or, or put themselves out as slightly better probably than they are in real life. And so that's not something new. That's something that, that, that we can understand that I don't necessarily have to be a hypocrite in order to understand the concept that at times 
we put off a self of our, uh, a version of ourselves that may not necessarily be totally, you know, accurate because either we don't know the person or we're not comfortable with the person or we're not comfortable with the situation. So we come off different than maybe how we actually are. But, but the idea here is someone who is on purpose, right? Purposely dressing themselves in sheep's clothing. So they're purposely trying to, to come off or, or, or give the impression that they know Christ or that they uh, are church people or that they are Christians or that they um, are a part of church culture. People who are genuinely uh, in, in intending to deceive you by coming off a certain kind of way. And so this is the warning, like be careful. Be careful um, because inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And I know that this is kind of hard uh, to, to put into words in, 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 in terms of, well, how am I supposed to, to discern, right? How am I supposed to know uh, who's lying to me, who's not lying to me, who's just trying to impress me, and who's, who's legit? Um, and this can be difficult, especially for a new Christian and, and even older Christians or more mature Christians. When you have someone that is really skilled at lying and manipulating and they're just a really good con artist, it can be difficult even for mature Christians to discern uh, if this is somebody that they can trust, if this is somebody that's real, if this is somebody authentic. And because Christ knows, like Jesus knows, God knows that it's hard hard. He's not telling us to reject people from the get. He's telling us to be careful. And then he gives us the litmus test, right? To see if this person is real, if this person is authentic. And so this is what he goes into in the next few verses. And he says, he says, by your fruit, by their fruit or by, yeah, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Um, and so this means we're going to have to do a little bit of observing. We're going to have to do a little bit of digging. We're going to have to do a little bit uh, of research on these people. And now when I say research, I don't mean stalking them online. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating like wasting your time, you know, doing, doing, you know, in-depth background searches on, on people, unless you feel like you have to, because this person is infiltrating your life or infiltrating your church or infiltrating your organization. And there's just something about them that doesn't settle with you, then by all means, you know, do what you got to do. But for the average person, that's just, you know, meeting someone and, and just wondering, you know, like, you, you're going to have to take some time to, to figure that out. You're going to have to observe uh, their fruit. And so uh, the, he poses the question, do people pick grapes from th uh, thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And obviously the answer is, is no. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good, uh, good fruit every tree. Uh, that does not bear good fruit. Well, well that's, you know, uh, going into something a little bit different. But but uh, just from these particular scriptures, right, take some time to observe observe them. Take some time to to analyze the, the way that they approach people, the way that they answer people, the way um, that they react. I think for me, the biggest giveaway is how a person reacts to things that are unexpected, to things that are surprises, or even to things that they don't necessarily uh, like or appreciate, right? Because in a five minute conversation, you could you know, be friendly and you can come off as, as however you wanna come off. But if I accidentally bump into you, or if I accidentally uh, you know, do something that, that bothers you, the way you react ultimately will show me what kind of fruit you're bearing. And so uh, if I say something controversial, how would you react? If I, and I'm not saying to provoke people, that is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying go around provoking people to test what kind of fruit they have. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying be mindful. When there's an opportunity to observe somebody uh, react to something unexpected or react to something that's a surprise or or even just speak a certain kind of way. And we'll actually get into the fruit of 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 your words and how you speak in a little bit. But but be mindful, like don't take what they're giving you, what they're 
whatever kind of impression they're trying to make, do not take that at face value. Now, they might be a great person, and, and Holy Spirit, and the, and the thing for more mature Christians, and, and for, for Christians that are barely learning and barely growing, one of the things that you should be praying for, because it is a gift of Holy Spirit, is the spirit of discernment, the, the capacity to discern what is good and what is bad. And a lot of times that feeling is the difference between being at peace and feeling unsettled. And so many of us have had instances where we meet people and immediately like we don't feel easy. Like there's something on the inside of us that we're like, oh, I don't know about this person. That is Holy Spirit speaking to you. That is the gift of discernment that is being uh, way awakened on the inside of you to, to essentially tell you, hey, you know, watch out for this person, watch out, you know, Either this person is, is planning something or doing something, or this person is just not right for you to hang around or to be with at this time. But you have to listen to those warning signs. You have to listen to when Holy Spirit is speaking to you in that way. Then I, I hope that, that many of us have, have gotten to the place in our lives where we meet people um, and we just have like a real peace about that person. There's something about when we're around them, when we're talking with them, when we're hanging out with them, that we feel at home, we feel at peace. They feel like a part of the family without even, you know, getting too far along in, in our friendship or relationship or whatever. They just feel like they're a part of the family or they're a part uh, of, of, of the family of God. And it just feels natural and you feel connected. And that is Holy Spirit giving you again discernment that this is a good person or this is a person um, that is going to be beneficial to your life because they're going to bring blessing and they're going to bring, you know, all the good fruit that a, a good tree bears. And so that would be the gift of discernment. And so many times you don't... For, for more mature Christians, I would say many times you, you kind of just go straight to Holy Spirit. You say, okay, Holy Spirit, tell me, you know, good or bad, is this person going to bring peace or is this person going to bring, you know, you know, bad things, contention, strife, uh, destruction, you know. Um, and he, Holy Spirit is good enough to tell you. Holy Spirit loves you enough. God loves you enough to tell you if you ask him. But if for whatever reason you are having trouble figuring it out, again, observe the fruit. Observe how they react. Are they kind? Are they gentle? Are they humble? Are, uh, do they walk in love? Do they have joy? Like those are the fruit of the spirit. And if these people actually have that fruit, then you, you, you're pretty much able to, to, for instance, say, okay, that's a good tree because they're bearing good fruit. If they come off a certain way, but in the end, they're impatient, they're rude, they're unkind, they, they don't uh, uh, walk in love, they're constantly criticizing or hating people, like that would tell you, hey, that's bad fruit. This is a bad tree. I need to stay away from this person. Um, and so essentially the, that's the litmus test, right? It is what kind of fruit are they bearing? Um, so the last two scriptures there, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is a reference to, to hell at the end of the day. And, and we're going to get get to that in a minute. But at the end of the day, the, the person that doesn't bear good fruit is a person who is not connected to the vine. And somebody, and the vine is Jesus. Somebody who's not connected to the vine is not truly saved. And if you're not truly saved, you will end up in hell. I mean, like, that's just the way it is. Uh, thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Again, at the end of the day, if they are consistently rude, consistently angry, consistently unkind, consistently impatient, consistently um, just bearing the, the evidence of bad fruit, you know, always have a bad attitude, always criticizing, always hating, always being negative, that is bad fruit. It is a bad tree. And you need to stay away. You just need to stay away from that person. The second subheading within these scriptures, because remember, this is supposed to be Matthew 7, 15 to 23. The second part, verses 21 to 23, focuses a little bit more, not on the prophet, but on the disciple, on the disciple. And so let's look at Matthew 7, 21 to 23 really quickly here. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons in your name perform and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. So now the focus is being shifted from your capacity to, to discern uh, hearts or to discern, uh, you know, people to God's capacity to discern hearts and discern people. And for those of you that think that you're fooling people, in the end, you're not going to be able to fool God. Like, I, I really, truly don't care how good you are at manipulating, how good you are at at convincing people that you're something that you're not, at the end of the day, you cannot deceive God. In fact, the word says, you know, God will not be mocked. You will not be able to stand before God and convince him that you're something that you're not. And and this is incredible to me because it says, and, and, and look, it's talking about people who actually ministered, right? People who actually spoke about Jesus, who witnessed about God, who who performed miracles and cast out demons. And he says, on the day when we when we meet, when you finally die and you and you meet me, you're gonna be you're gonna be like God. I I I went to church. I tithed. I did this. I did that. Again, cast out demons and the healed were where the 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 sick were healed and miracles were performed. I did it all in your name. And God's gonna look at you and be like, I'm I'm sorry, dude. I don't know who you are. Like I I don't you know you are not a part of me. You were never a branch that was connected to me, the vine, right? And so uh, I think this is just incredible because not only does he not only does he say, I don't know you, get away from me. He calls them evil doers. He says, away from me, you evil doers. And this is what people don't understand. Like there's power in the word and there's power in the name of Jesus. So even if you're not uh, uh, what I would call a true Christian, you're not someone who's truly saved. And by truly saved, I mean somebody who has an active relationship with Jesus where you on a regular basis communicate with him and you're constantly striving to do better and to live better and to do right by God. You've dedicated your life and, and your talents and your time to moving the kingdom of God forward. If, if you are not uh, interested in that kind of life and you're not living for God, you are the type of person uh, that could, in theory, say, pray for someone in the name of Jesus and God uses you to heal that person. That doesn't mean that you're right with God. That doesn't mean that you have an active relationship with God. And that doesn't mean that when you die, you're going to heaven because uh, it has nothing to do with you. The name of Jesus is sufficiently powerful that when you speak it all by itself, it is power. All by itself, it is life. All by itself, it has the capacity to set people free and to heal people and, and to perform creative miracles and to resurrect the dead. The name, just simply speaking, the name of Jesus has weight and has power. So you could be theoretically uh, in, 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 in a non-active relationship with God who on the outside you claim you're a Christian, but you're really not. You're really not saved. You're not living for God. Say a prayer in the name of Jesus and God respond to that prayer because again, Jesus, just speaking the name Jesus is sufficiently powerful. Also, uh, this 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 idea of 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 you know you know Lord Lord right calling God Lord as if He actually was your Lord. I think we we treat God. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I feel like we treat God more like like you know a concept, an idea, a notion. Uh, worst case scenario, we treat him like an equal. He is not. He is not. 
we use the, the Christian ease language of calling Jesus our Lord and calling Jesus our King and calling God our Heavenly Father, but we don't treat God like He's our Father. We don't treat Jesus like He's our King. We don't treat Jesus like He's our Lord. Because when, when you use those titles or those monikers, Lord, King, Father, that means that you are subject to their authority. That means that you don't belong to yourself. When you call someone Lord, you are, are, are confessing a, a state in which they are above you and you are subject to them. When you call someone king, you, you are placing them above you in terms of their capacity to tell you what to do and their capacity to guide and direct your life, and you are subject to them. The vast majority of, of Christians do not treat God as though he's father and king and Lord. They treat him as equals, and they approach their relationship with God uh, through negotiation. Okay, Let's talk about this. Let's deal with this. Let's you and I go back and forth about this. And in the end, a lot of people end up doing what they want to do, not what God wants to do. So how can you call yourself a Christian and how can you call God Lord and King and Father and not treat him and not live in such a way that your life tells me, oh, you have a King, you have a Lord, you have a Father. You're living in a way that doesn't that doesn't show that. You're living in a way that doesn't demonstrate that. And so that's why this second part is focused not on prophets, but on disciples. Because now it's taking it, again, it, it's turning the tables from your capacity to discern good and bad fruit and good and bad trees to God's capacity to judge you. He sees your heart. He knows the truth. And it doesn't matter how many demons you cast out and how many miracles you perform. If you are not right with God and you're not living in a way where truly you can call him your Lord and your King and your Father, then you are not of God. Away from me, evildoer, is what Jesus says. Away from me, evildoer. So you've got to... You've got to keep yourself in check. You've got to keep your heart in check. And you have to realize that God will use anything and anyone that he has to to accomplish his will. That does not mean that you're right with God. And, and to that end, I will just remind you that the, the story in the Judges, right? Uh, I believe it's Judges, but I could be wrong. Um, where he opens the mouth of a donkey. If he will open the mouth of a donkey to accomplish his will, you tell me he's not going to use a person who's not saved or a person who's not right? Absolutely not. He'll use whoever and whatever he has to to accomplish his will on the earth. Do not confuse him using you as you being right with God because they're not the same. They're not, they're not the same. They're not one and the same. Um, so next we're going to look at Luke chapter 6 verses 35, uh, uh, 43, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 6 verses 43 to 45. This is Luke's version of a tree and its fruit, um, and essentially it, it pretty much says the same thing, but I want to look really quickly at the last scripture. So we'll read these here really quickly and then focus on the last scripture. Luke chapter 6 verses 43 to 45. 43 says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 44, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs for thorn, from thorn bushes or grapes from, from briars. Verse 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so this one explains it obviously way more clearly and way more concisely, especially verse 45. A good man will bring good things and an evil man will bring evil things. And it all starts with the heart. And the, the, the study is going to look at that, so I'm not going to go too much into that for the moment. But I do want to focus on this last part that says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And to that, I just want to say, believe people when they tell you who they are. Believe people when they tell you who they are. Because if you talk to somebody for long enough, what's in their heart is going to start seeping out, right? 
Because again, a first impression, a, a short conversation of three or four minutes, somebody can come off as literally anything. They can pretend for a little while to be kind and loving and generous and gentle and meek and all those things. But keep someone talking for long enough and you will know what is in their heart. When the facade finally falls away and when that person finally feels comfortable enough to share and reveal who they actually are, believe them. Believe them. Words are just as much evidence of the fruit that they bear as actions. So earlier I was telling you that you could discern somebody by how they, really quickly I should say, by how they react to things that are unexpected or accidents or things that they didn't plan for or surprises. But again, if you're able to speak to someone for, for a, a while, about 20, 30 minutes into that conversation, when they begin to drop their guard, when they begin to get comfortable and they start to tell you things, Listen to what they're saying because they're going to speak from the abundance of their heart. And if they're telling you in, in so many words who they are, believe them. Don't shrug it off. Don't, don't shrug, don't throw it to the side and say, oh, well, they were just joking. Oh, well, they were just whatever. No. If they're willing to joke, and, and look, this is just a really simple example. If you're having a conversation with somebody and you're like 20, 30 minutes in, and again, they're getting comfortable, they're getting, you know, their guards coming down and they start joking around. If they're sharing nasty jokes with you, that means perversion is in their heart. Believe them. Don't shrug it off as like, oh, it's just a joke. No, you don't joke about those kinds of things unless they're meditations of your heart. Listen to what people are saying. If you get 20, 30 minutes into a conversation and again, they start to get comfortable, their guard starts to come down, they start talking to you, all of a sudden they say, oh, I hate whatever, whatever. And they're talking about a cultural group or a, a racial group or a, a whatever. Listen to what they're saying. There's hate in their heart. There's hate in their heart. Believe them. Don't shrug it off as, oh, well, it was just an offhand comment. Oh, it was just, no, no, no. Believe people when they tell you who they are and what they believe. Believe them. Um, so let's go ahead and go into what the, the study actually has to say. So um, this is, again, Unit 2, Chapter 3, Lesson 3G. People are one of two trees. Um, and so essentially... The book talks about dangers within the church, and it's pretty much all that this section kind of focuses on is dangers within the church. And so um, the book essentially talks about how persecution from the outside grows the church, but false teachings from within uh, destroy the church. And that's from page 60. It's not a direct quote, but it is from page 60. Uh, and so essentially the, the book says that the greatest danger or the greatest um destructive force in the church is false teaching this if you've studied church history at all you know that this has been the biggest problem the church has faced from its inception from its inception people have been arguing about what is true and what is not true what is of god what is not of god so this is something that the church has dealt with forever has dealt with for ages um, and that's been the biggest source of division in the church, right? The church has split, um, and by church, I mean like the global church, has split time and time and time again over the centuries, over the millennia, uh, because people disagree on how to interpret the Bible and what, again, what is true, what is not true, what is God, what is not God. Um, and, and there have been moves uh, of people who are blatantly False. I mean, like they, they blatantly are taking the word of God and they're twisting it and they're turning it for their own benefit. Um, and they don't care about the church and they will end up destroying the church for their own benefit, for their own cause, for their own pride or greed or whatever. Um, and so this, this is the most dangerous threat to the church 
Historically, again, if you've studied uh, any kind of or any amount of church history, throughout history, when persecution comes, when attacks from the outside come, the church grows, the church multiplies. There's something about seeing people stand for what they believe, uh, even in the face of oppression, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of death. There's something about seeing people stand for what they believe that inspires others to believe with them. And so whenever persecution comes, uh, and this is again something that the book explains, whenever persecution comes, the church explodes. Throughout history, every single time persecution comes from the outside, the church explodes. When we see the church begin to diminish, when we see the church begin to decline, when we see the church begin to, to lose some of its power and authority, and specifically its influence in the world, it's usually because of corruption on the inside. So false doctrine, false teaching, false prophets that are, are just for their own gain and their own pride and their own fame trying to do something uh, for themselves. And, and again, they don't love the church. They don't love God and they don't love people. Um, they're interested in what they can get for themselves. And this is what causes division and strife and contention in the church and ultimately divides the church. And every single time that we divide, we lose a little bit of our efficacy. Every single time that we divide, we lose a little bit of our power. Every single time that we divide, we lose a little bit of our authority and a whole lot of our influence because everybody on the outside is looking at us thinking, well, you're supposed to be united. And when they see us divide, when they see us split, um, it's be, it, you know, it causes us to look weak uh, and to lose our influence in the world. But a lot of that is rooted in false teachings, false doctrines, false prophets that, that are just in it for themselves. Um, so it's one of the, the greatest destructive powers within the church, um, false teachings from false prophets. A person's fruit, uh, the other thing the book says is a person's fruit is connected to their heart. And, and again, we were talking about this idea that God, we don't have a lot of times the capacity to see someone's heart, but God does. And in the end, God will judge based on your heart. Um, so if you know somebody for long enough that you're able to see their heart based on consistent production of fruit, so consistently they're producing good fruit, that will show you where their heart is. And if you are around someone for long enough that you see them consistently produce bad fruit, again, that will show you where their heart is. Because in the end, what comes out into your life, what not only what you speak, but what you do, is a result of what is in your heart. Remember, the, where where the 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 heart and the mind are connected. So you meditate on something for long enough, and and it contaminates your heart. Or you meditate on something in your heart for long enough, and it will begin to dictate the way you think. And ultimately, you will you will follow the 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 scriptures say that where where the mind goes, the man follows. But your mind, a lot of times, is being dictated by your feelings, which is in your heart. So if something is in your heart, it will eventually contaminate the rest of you and then you will end up acting and reacting based on what is in your heart and that is inevitable it is inevitable um, if you again if you're around somebody for long enough you'll be able to see their heart based on the consistent uh, the fruit that they are consistently producing be them good or bad and so the other thing that the book mentions is that truly good fruit is expressed through character um, and character is something that has to be built, right? And most of us, uh, for the most part, when we think of character, we think of that of that being something good, right? Somebody who has a strong character, somebody who has a character that demonstrates excellence and integrity and morality. Um, that is what we would we would consider good, strong character. Uh, someone who doesn't bend, someone who doesn't fold, someone who doesn't run away, but somebody who's dependable, uh, somebody who, who is transparent and who is faithful and who's devoted, that is what we would call somebody with good character. Uh, at the end of the day, somebody with good fruit, so somebody who's consistently producing, again, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and gentleness and humility uh, and kindness and, and goodness, those people... Uh, will eventually build or God will build in them a good, strong character. Um, and so it, it essentially says that while words, what you speak, words and works, your actions and reactions, although they're good indicators, the best lit litmus test is the, the test of character. 
the test of character. So again, this is something that you may have to observe over time. Um, you may not necessarily pick this up from somebody right away or within the first two or three meetings or first two or three outings or hangouts or even dates. You may have to hang out with somebody over uh, the course of time to see their true character. And the reason I say this is because for many people, especially in terms of romantic situations, you don't really get to know someone until you live with them. Uh, even for friends, right? You know, even the best of friends may not truly, truly know each other until they become roommates and they live together. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, so this is who this person actually is. Um, and then for, for other situations, other types of relationships, uh, you know, a lot of times you won't see where someone really, really is until they get in trouble. Until there, there's two, there's two uh, character tests. Uh, one, what, what do they do when they get in trouble? And two, what do they do when they get blessed? So when somebody gets blessed with a title or with power or with fame or with money or, or just more influence in the church, right? Or, or anywhere, organization, your job, your family, wherever. When somebody gets blessed, how do they react? That is a test of character. And when somebody gets into trouble, how do they react? That will reveal their character. So those are two uh, really good character tests uh, that, that will reveal to you where someone really truly is at because there are some really skilled con artists and, and truth be told, there's a lot of people that genuinely don't realize that they're still dealing with character flaws or with character issues because they go for long stretches of time, either not getting blessed or not getting into trouble. Uh, and so they kind of live in this really gray neutral zone where nothing's happening. And so nothing's being revealed because nothing's happening. But once they come into a blessing or once they get into trouble, uh, again, that would be really good ways of, of seeing where a person's character really uh, reveals their heart. Uh, so the last thing I want to mention here really quickly is it says if we cannot, uh, it's a quote from the book, if we cannot know a person well enough to see his inner fruit, we should not follow him. Page uh, 61. Uh, and it's true. Like I said, I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily doing a deep background check on people that are just passerbys in our lives. If there's somebody that you're interested in following or somebody that you're interested in being connected to or being connected with, especially in terms of partnership, financial partnership, ministry partnership, or even just friendship or even romantic relationships, if there's someone that you're genuinely, genuinely interested in, in being connected with and following, do the research. Take the time. Again, everybody else, if they're just passerbys, don't, like, I wouldn't even I'll waste my time. If really, truly, you know, you're not supposed to be connected to them, I genuinely believe that if you put it in the hands of God, God will shut it down if you're not supposed to be connected to that person. Um, but if, but if again, if there's a situation where you're like, I, I want to be connected with this person or I want to partner with this person or this ministry or this church or whatever, be this person's friend, do your research, make your observations, but don't make a commitment until you know for sure, until you have that peace from Holy Spirit that these are the right people, these are good people, they're good trees and they're bearing good fruit. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're not able to, to really, really know, then I would just refrain from, from following that person. Uh, you're not going to die if you don't follow that person. Trust me, you'll be fine. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's all I got uh, for this week for you guys. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, coming back to our channel. And if this is your first time, I hope you had a good time. I, I, I hope you learned something uh, and that something, you know, in all that was taught today encouraged you. Uh, next week, we're finally crossing over to chapter four. If you want to look ahead, uh, we're still in unit two, the Great Galilean Ministry. But if you want to look ahead for the entire chapter of chapter four, chapter four is called The Power of the King. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapters eight to ten, Mark chapter one, verse twenty nine, all the way to chapter three, verse nineteen. And Luke chapter four, verses fourteen, all the way to Luke chapter nine, verse six. Um, and again, this is to cover the entire chapter, which will probably be here for a couple of months because it's really juicy. It's really good. We're, uh, when it talks about the power of the king, we're actually talking about the healing ministry and the signs, wonders, and miracles ministry that Jesus uh, was a part of and that Jesus um, displayed on the earth, right? So it's the, the literal the literal 
power of God flowing through Jesus. And in the different stories where we see him um, working, you know, signs, wonders, and miracles. For this particular lesson, though, uh, lesson 1A, we're going to be looking at Jesus desires to heal. Jesus desires to heal. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. And Luke chapter 5, verses uh, 12 to 16. Okay, guys. So if you are local, as always, I just want to take a moment to invite you to our church. If you're passing through San Angelo or you live in San Angelo, our uh, local church is open. Uh, we are having in-person services on Sundays at 9 o'clock. We have prayer. At 10 o'clock, we have our bilingual service, which is worship and preaching, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, and then on Wednesdays, of course, we have in-person services where we do prayer at six o'clock in our sanctuary. And then we uh, are doing a uh, switching right now between Bible study and uh, preaching on Wednesdays at seven o'clock. We have a uh, class that our lead pastor is teaching on Holy Spirit. He's about to wrap that up this week. Uh, and then he'll go into a new study. But we also have a preaching class that our pastor teaches, uh, our pastor Noe Hernandez. And so he's having his students uh, get some practicum uh, experience, some, some, some preaching experience, um, and giving them the opportunity to do that on Wednesday night. So we will be listening to fresh words from brand new preachers uh, as they step up and follow the leading that, uh, that God has placed on their heart into, into ministry, into preaching, into a new level uh, uh, of their personal relationship and, again, their ministry with the Lord. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully, again, if you're here, if you're passing through, if you're able to visit, please come. You're personally invited by me to come and to join us uh, and to just to enjoy the presence of God here in his sanctuary in person. Hope you guys have a really great evening. I hope you're able to study ahead. Uh, and again, I hope that these lessons have been a blessing to you. Have a great rest of your week. We love you guys. We miss you guys. We're praying for you guys and we hope to see you soon. Bye.